Welcome, everyone, as we continue our Holidays with Our Heroes series here on Eco Ask Why. As you know by now, between here and Christmas, you're going to be hearing inspiring stories every week from our heroes as we celebrate the holiday season together. And there's a big surprise coming on Christmas week you do not want to miss. And trust me, it's going to be a fun one. So I'm excited for that to come out. Now today, you're going to hear from Paul Van Mitri. And you'll remember him from episode 96, where he talked about manufacturing a recipe for differentiation, where he talked about some of the really cool things he's doing at Pro Shop ERP. Now, Paul has an amazing story. He's a fun guy, and I know you're just going to enjoy hearing his, about his journey and some of the cool things he's doing in manufacturing. You know, and those war stories, they are coming in, and they are good. You know, we're looking for the, the stuff that you want to sit around at the dinner table and talk about. And the submissions are flying in. We're excited to put that series together. You can give those submissions to us as a DM on Instagram or Facebook. And the links are in the show notes. Now, let's get some insight from Paul on about his amazing journey. Cue the music. So welcome to Eco Ask Why. Today we have a hero conversation I'm excited to have with us, Paul Van Meter, and he is the co-founder of Pro Shop ERP. So welcome, Paul. Hey, Chris. Nice to be here. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Looking forward to talking with you. I'm looking forward to it too, my friend. So, you know, start us off. We'll tell our listeners a little bit about you and, and, and the journey to where you're at now. Are we sure we have enough time? No. Oh, we got, we can make time. Semi-short version. <laughs> so... Growing up, I, I loved building things. I loved taking apart things. Um, you know, I even worked as a carpenter with my dad for a bunch of years as a teenager. And I always wanted to, to, to work on, and I loved cars too. I was a diehard car guy, motorhead, loved tinkering on cars, buying cars, fixing cars. And so I um, actually started in, uh, with an engineering, pro mechanical engineering program uh, at Boston University. And... I immediately just found it super dry, right? It just wasn't exciting. It wasn't hands-on. And it's like, this isn't building stuff. Um, but I thought I wanted to become like an automotive engineer. So anyway, I, I decided to, uh, to not follow that path. And I, and I found this program uh, called the Vehicle Research Institute, which basically was a, a hands-on sort of pseudo engineering program that allowed you to design and build cars. And so I'm like, that's cool, what I'm doing. So I went there met these incredible like-minded guys that um, also just love that, love building things. And this, this, um, this program had a full-fledged machine shop in it, right? So, and we had almost unlimited access to it. This was in the 90s. Now, where, uh, where date, was this at? Myself. Where? This was at a, at a university called Western Washington University. Okay. That program, unfortunately, uh, no longer exists in the same way. But, uh, but it was just an amazing place to learn stuff, design stuff, build stuff, machine stuff. Um, and we would, every year we would build a car, a formula SAE car for those, a lot of, a lot of engineers get into formula SAE, but we would design this small single seat race car. And then we would go compete against other universities at the end of the school year and then see who came out on top. Nice. And it was the most fun thing <laughs> that I've now, ever done in my life up to that point. Is that an open um, wheel type car? It is. It's a small single seat open wheeled car with a 600 cc displacement limit. So it's all motorcycle engines, okay. although there's now electric ones too, of course. But uh, so yeah, um, about a f our car, I mean, we, we built three cars. Um, the most successful one was a 450 pound car with about 100 horsepower from this motorcycle engine. Can you imagine the power to weight Ooh, ratio on man. that? Did, um, did you get to uh, get behind the wheel of that one? Oh yeah, it's all student driven. Oh and wow! So, uh, fun tidbit: I own that car now. Oh I, really? The university was running out of space. Like we got too many cars. I bought it, refurbed it with some friends, and we autocross it on the weekends. That is awesome, so, man. It is really fun. So anyway, sorry we got sidetracked, but um, so in this program did a lot of machining um, and absolutely just fell in love with it. And so as we were getting close to graduation, my, my buddies and I, my partners on this team, 
we started talking about starting a shop together rather than just scattering to the wind and going off and getting jobs. And, you know, we were like, you know what, we love working together as a team. Um, we love machining. Let's start a shop. And, uh, and to be perfectly honest, that shop was actually a stepping stone. We thought to eventually starting a small niche car company, um, which never happened, but I still haven't given up on that dream someday. But uh, anyway, so we started a machine shop um, straight out of college. I graduated from college and just opened a shop. Um, and my uh, one of my one of the guys on the team was a little bit older. Actually, it was two of them were brothers. One was a little older, and he came back, took some classes. But he had a he owned a house with enough equity in it to take out a second mortgage, and that's what we used to fund the company. So um, we bought a Haas VF4. Uh, found a used manual mill and lathe and found a little 2,000 square foot warehouse space that we opened up shop. And you were off and running. We were off and running. Um, so get this, though. There were six of us in that company to start. Six equal owners, one machine, <laughs> 2,000 square foot facility. <laughs> it was crazy. Um, and we started knocking on doors, beating the street, looking for work, because um, that's a lot of mouths to feed. Um, but of course, we were, you know, a bunch of the guys all lived in a house together. Um, I had a, I had a girlfriend that would eventually become my wife, so I, I didn't cohabitate with them. But uh, still, you know, we started knocking on doors, looking for work. Um, and so this was actually in '97. We opened our doors in '97, and uh, so the economy was pretty decent back then. Um, and so it wasn't that hard. We found work. We started doing work, bought some more machines, hired some more employees and just grew it, you know, over the years for about 17 years. You know, as every shop owner knows, uh, it's an incredibly hard business to run. You know, we were basically just a job shop. Right. Um, and uh, we were fortunate to find find some good customers that did some repeat work as well. So we did a combination of just one off stuff and some repeat business. Um, and, uh, over the years, um, you know, nine 11 happened just four years after we opened and that almost devastated, that almost killed us. Like we were just on the cusp of going out of business. Um, but we found a business advisor through the local small business development center, an amazing resource for anyone out there looking for guidance and help usually through universities. Um, but uh, made it through um, and, uh, you know, kept growing the company. And, and, and actually the way sort of tie it to what I'm doing now, um, when we got to the size, just about three years in, we had about a dozen employees or so and three or four machines. And um, we needed some software to run our shop. And we had no idea what kind of software this was, what it was called, how to even look it up. Um, but we asked around and people started telling us some of the things they were using. And so we had these, these um, you know, salespeople come and give us demos and show us these software products. And we were just totally underwhelmed and disappointed by what they were showing us, right? We, in a job shop, what matters most is execution of your jobs. Assuming you have enough work coming in, you know? And uh, um, so if you have enough work coming in, you gotta execute to make any kind of margin you know, and job shops have really slim margins typically. Um, so these software products just didn't help with any of the execution of, sh of the shop. You know, they did fine for putting stuff, your orders in and managing your inventory and making invoices. But when it came to the shop floor, they just didn't have the features that we had already built into our Excel spreadsheets and things that we had homegrown ourselves. So anyway, we decided to not buy one of those products. We decided instead we hired a software developer as a full-time employee, basically, um, and just started telling them what we wanted it, what we wanted the software to do, and, and our machinists and our inspectors and our people that did accounting and all that stuff. We just said, yeah, this is what we this is what we need, and we just organically grew it over the years um, until our biggest machine shop customer saw it and said, hey, this is way better looking than what we're using. Would you sell it to us? And we were like, no, <laughs> it's just for us. We don't know how to be a software company. Um, but they were very convincing and uh, we decided to give it a shot and kind of the rest is history. You know, we eventually sold the shop after 17 years 
Um, we had about 75 people on staff. We had about 30 machines, three shifts, AS9100 certified for both manufacturing and engineering work, um, and went off into the software business. So yeah. for the last five years, we've been doing that, doing software. Now, do you, the, the, that core group of the first six, are you got six still together at ProShop? Uh, three of us are. And the other, actually, no, four of us, because one of, one of them is not a founder, but is an employee. Um, and then the other two guys are, are both good friends still, but they went off and did other things over the years. That's a really cool story, man. That's awesome. Yeah. Great stuff. Yeah. I mean, and hats off to you guys for recognizing that, you know, you don't have to stay underwhelmed. You can, you can, you can build your own, and that's what you did. Mm-hmm. Yep, yep. Very cool, very cool. So how about when, you, when you're thinking out there for shops now, what do you see is, is challenging machining, you know, as, as we move into the future? Yeah, so I I personally think that the machining industry in the in North America has a really bright future, right? With with COVID and with a whole bunch of other sort of forces, there's a lot of emphasis on onshoring, bringing bringing manufacturing back to the, back to North America, and um, so I think the prospects are really bright. Um, you know, I always say that you know most shops are are uh, founded by really good technicians, right? Good machinist programmers, but they don't know how to run a business. So learning how to, how to run those businesses is, is definitely a challenge. And then I'd say one of the also biggest trends sort of right now or, or challenges is, um, is this uh, whole baby boomer generation that, you know, there's a lot of talent there, a lot of knowledge and they're retiring and, and not enough shops have the systems in place to have that continuity and to draw all that knowledge out of those folks' heads into the next generation. Um, so that's, uh, that's a big one that needs to be solved. No doubt. And, no doubt. And, and if you're thinking, if you're trying to convince someone, Paul, to, to, to enter that machining field, because you can see you're very passionate about it. So <laughs> any advice of the, or for people out there that may be listening that, that haven't considered machining that you'd like to, to offer up to them? Yeah, well, almost every, um, I mean, in almost every town, city, region, there's going to be some technical colleges or community colleges that might have machining programs. Definitely look at those. Uh, quite honestly, I think um, uh, there's a gentleman named Titan, um, Titan Gilroy, who has this Titans of CNC Academy, completely free, all online. Go get some free trial software of, of Mastercam or something like that, and and um, you know, and start learning it on your own time. And then there's even a network of what are called small groups, you know, shops around the whole country, uh, where you can call up and say, "Hey, I'm trying to learn about this stuff," and they'll invite you in uh, and show you in their own shops. So that's a great way to get a first little intro. But but um, yeah, I'd say the community college route uh, is yeah. is a great option. And then you know, look for, uh, you know, just Google for machine shops in your area, and just start calling people and say, hey, I'm interested in looking at a career in machining. And I almost guarantee you that those shops will be like, yeah, absolutely. Come down. Let's talk. We'll show you um, yeah. that all the shops are looking for, for good people, you know, and the ones with good training systems will be very happy to bring someone in that maybe not has a lot of technical skills, but they have a desire and they a good work ethic and can learn. Um, and then they'll teach you on the job. Are they doing more uh, internships or co-ops? Do you see that in the shop, in the machining world? Not enough. Not nearly enough is like they do it in Europe, for example. Um, I think that's, we used to do that decades ago. Um, and I think that's a really important part of the formula for, for, for bringing sort of the manufacturing industry back to, to, to where it was. But, uh, but no, not enough yeah. formal uh, internships. Yeah. Unfortunately. That's it. Just a great way to get in and, and see and get exposed to so many different things. So it's just something to consider. But, you know, as as you've had a chance in your career, I know you mentioned that that business consultant helped you uh, mm -hmm. in, in that time of need there around 9-11. Any other mentors that have stood out to you that have helped you kind of build you to where you are now? Yeah, um, I think I'd say two, two different folks. Um and they're both really close. So the first one would actually be my wife. Um, and the second one would be my business partner, Kelsey. Um, 
they have both just been incredibly influential and instrumental to me. So my wife d did a marketing degree, so she's been sort of my my go-to person to, to, to ask, all right, you know, how should I approach this from a marketing perspective, right? Because I was an engineering guy, a hands-on guy. I didn't know marketing. Um, so she really helped me there. Um, and that was one of the big differences between us, you know, growing slowly as a, you know, as a, as a small shop versus, um, you know, getting into a pretty good size shop, right? 75 people. So in a relatively short amount of time. So, um, so that was really important. Um, I'd say find someone in your life that knows marketing, <laughs> uh, if you're running a company. Um, and then my partner, Kelsey, just an incredible, incredible man. Um, 100% ethical as long as the day is, or whatever that phrase is, the day is long, incredibly hardworking, really wise about decisions and strategy. You know, I'm like a, like a puppy sometimes just like barreling into stuff, you know, and he's like, hold on a second, you know, let's think about this a little bit more carefully. And so he and I are a really good balance. Um, and, uh, um, so I've learned a lot from him. Yeah. Um, a lot on people skills too. He's really good at that. That's great. I mean, thank you for sharing that. I could, I, we could, we could hear your voice change when you went, when you were talking about those two, uh, mentors. So that, we really love that. And it sounds like they've been, uh, you know, just really helped you develop and grow as a professional and a human. Yeah. No yeah. doubt. No doubt. How about, you know, I love that. I'm anxious to get your answer on this one. So common myths, you know, this, the question I ask a lot, depending on the people in their fields, but you're, you've been big in machining and there may be some, some, uh, myths out there about the machine shop world that, uh, uh, you just don't think are true, man. So if you get a chance to debunk something here, what would, what would it be? Well, I'd love to talk about two. One is if you're in the business and one is if you're external to the business. Okay. So the, the one with your internal, that if you're a great machinist, you know how to run a machine shop. That just could not be further from the truth. There you go. So, um, and I'll talk. I'll talk a little bit later about uh, a little bit more about learning about that. Um, but then the other from the outside, and this is an industry-wide issue, um, and it feeds into not enough people coming into the industry, is that there's this perception that manufacturing and machine shops specifically are dark, dirty, you know, um, unsafe places. And that also could not be further from the truth. You know, you go into any modern, you know, progressive shop, it is bright, it is clean, it is incredibly high tech. The jobs are really uh, well paying. They are, um, they're, they're fun, they're interesting. And uh, it's a, it's an amazing career that, uh, and, which pays way above average for most industries out there, right? Yeah. You get a desk job somewhere. Um, you're not going to, yeah, it's just, it's, it's so anyway, that's, I'd love to help debunk that one. Yeah. Um, I know every, everyone I know in the manufacturing industry tries to debunk that as well. And it's a challenge to try to get it. I think we need to, I don't know, there needs to be a huge PR campaign for the whole manufacturing industry that gets into high schools and even middle schools and, and school guidance counselors and, and the parents of all these kids that it is not a second rate option to go into machining That's or right. manufacturing. That's right. Not even a little bit. Yeah, we've addressed this in a couple episodes, man. And just, I think just having more conversations like this and being open and then, and promoting the work that you do. Cause I think if, if people saw some machining that, that, that you've seen throughout the years, it would connect some of those dots for sure. Absolutely. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. So, so when you're looking through, man, and, and you're you're doing the work that makes you the happiest, you know, what are you doing in those moments, Paul? What brings you that fulfillment? It's the actually the result of the work that brings me the fulfillment. Um, my heart just absolutely soars when I talk to a customer that we have helped. That they say, you know, you guys have made a measurable and meaningful difference in my life and the life of my employees. Right. Like I just can't imagine something better than that. No doubt, man. No doubt. How about when you look back at, cause you've done some really cool things at the previous shop as well at pro at pro shop, any mm -hmm. highlights, anything that stands out as man, that was a cool project or something that you were involved with that you like to share. 
I mean, just the process of building that company was, was uh, incredible. I mean, just so hard, so, you know, highs and lows, right? Just days of incredible joy when we landed, you know, a huge new pro program or customer. Um, and then just the really tough lows when, um, you know, like after 9-11 and we almost went out of business because we had no idea what we were doing to actually run a business, right? Mm -hmm. We were fine at making parts, but that's only one small part of having a successful business. Um, so, you know, taking, uh, you know, going from, from straight from college into one of the most challenging types of, you know, uh, companies you can possibly have to run and, you know, building that up, um, having a really great culture. It was our, we, we loved our employees so much. They loved us. We had almost no turnover. It was just, it, it felt like a big family. It was really fun, you know, so that, um, and then the projects we got to work on. So, you know, I mentioned earlier that we were AS9100 certified for engineering work as well. So we got the opportunity to, um, you know, design and build some like big fixture tooling things for like the F-35 strike fighter that, you know, they were using to help m manufacture the thing. And we were designing it and submitting our designs to Lockheed Martin or Northrop Grumman. And they were saying, yeah, this looks great. Make us a bunch. And we'd make them and deliver them and get, go down onto the flight line and watch them use them to make these, their airplanes. So cool. That Just like so from awesome. a geek geek out tech perspective, that was, that stuff was so much fun. Um, but at the end of the day, it really comes down to the people that we got to work with yeah. and, uh, be part of our big extended family. Man, that is great. And to be, I guess, to be able to, to go to that flight line and see that really just connected a lot of, a lot of dots and man, it's, uh, you know, sound like he had some really great highlights, Paul. Yeah, it's fun. It's been really fun. So let's talk a little bit outside of work, man. Let's let's let our listeners know a little bit more about you. Uh, not at Pro Shop. So any hobbies you got? What what do you enjoy doing for fun? Well, I already mentioned I'm a motorhead, yeah, so I yeah. definitely love cars. Um, uh, I don't tinker on them as much as I used to. You know, like my own cars. Just you know, as we get older and have more stuff, you just if I'm going to get an oil change, I'm going to go get an oil change. But uh, right. but yeah, I still have that little. Uh, Formula SAK race car that I that I get to tinker with. Um, I love woodworking. I love building stuff. You know, I like I said, I worked as a carpenter with my dad as a teenager, and so learned a lot of fun skills there. And so um, really enjoy that. Love love hiking and backpacking. So every year, my uh, my dad and my sons and now my sister um, go on a three generation backpacking trip. Oh, you know, wow. two to four days, two to four nights you know, out in the, in the, uh, the mountains here in the Northwest. And, uh, there's nothing better sitting on a mountain, you know, watching the sunrise or the sunset. And, uh, that's I awesome. Love that too. That's awesome. So on the woodworking, you got me interested. What's one of your favorite projects that you've done off from a woodworking standpoint? Oh, I made my dad, um, a really beautiful table once, um, it was just a small little table, but um, it was, I forget, it was like a curly maple, just taking that finish, just absolutely beautiful wood. Um, but actually, now that I think about it, probably my favorite thing I've ever made was I made a chess set for my dad. Oh. Um, so the, the board was, was it actually, it was like three inches thick because it had drawers built into it for the pieces. It was made out of purple heart. And then the chess pieces themselves and the squares were brass and aluminum, and those were machined. Oh, so wow. Sort of a combination of my woodworking and metalworking. Yeah. Um, and and uh, actually, that I'm, I'm uh, my, uh, that actually was for my stepdad, and he passed away a couple of years ago. And so my mom is actually sending me that chess set. So I should be seeing it uh, any week now, and I need to buff out some of the tarnish and, and get it back up and play chess with my kids there you go man that sounds like a both worlds came together on that project yeah it was really really a neat one he loved it you know yeah well thanks for thank you for sharing that and and we do love to hear about our families you know you already mentioned your wife is one, mm -hmm. one of your mentors what else could, would you like to share about your family um yeah so i have two teenage boys um uh, one is 14 one is nine no i say he just turned 15 a couple days ago um and the other is 19. Um, 
great kids, um, you know, still trying to steer them to turn out great, <laughs> but I think they're, they're, they're coming along pretty nicely. Um, and, uh, and I have to give more than, more than, than full credit, uh, more than half credit for sure to my wife. She is just incredibly wise and patient and, uh, and helps our whole family be better people. There you go. Yeah. Well, I mean, you look p- pretty calm to have uh, two teenage boys, so you must got something going on, right? Or it's early in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> Very cool, man. Very cool. Thanks for sharing about that. How about any um, any resources that you find helpful? You know, podcasts mm-hmm. or books, YouTube. You, there's so many different things out there. Just it could yeah. be a personal or professional. Just things that you enjoy. Yeah, sure. So I guess on the business side for podcasts, um, I mean, yours is obviously a great one. The Making Chips podcast, um, really enjoy those guys. Uh, And we've, in all disclosure, we've become a sponsor there just because that's such focus on the machining industry. Manufacturing Happy Hour um, is another great one. And then the the Within Tolerance podcast, really been enjoying that one lately. Okay. And then I guess pseudo business, um, just development, um, the Tim Ferriss show. Um, I, I've been listening to that one for years now. Um, and then if I just need a good laugh, I'm going to, I'm going to listen to car talk. You know, okay. You know, those guys, well, there's only one of them left now, but they play, you know, all the old episodes and there's so many years of them, but just such, such fun. Sounds always, good. always laughing out loud, listening to that show. And then for books. Um, so the goal is a really important book for anyone to understand about about lean and and processes um i met i kind of alluded to this one earlier the e-myth or it's now called the e-myth revisited by michael gerber really important book for understanding the concept of building processes and building a company that doesn't rely on you as the owner as like the 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 main thing um and there's actually another book called built to sell um by john warello uh, i haven't read that one yet but it's on my list um it basically about the same concept of building your company to um to go you know further than just yourself right right, right. um with with the e-myth it's about the idea of of imagining your business as a franchise even if you never franchise it Hmm, okay. Um, right. You want to build those repeatable systems um, so that uh, it it just makes it easier to run a business, more yeah. process driven, more profitable. Um, and then uh, Good to Great is another book I, I just think is amazing. And then for any for salespeople out there, um, Sell the Way You Buy by David Pre, um, I think it's Premier 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 um, okay. is uh, is a great book. That's uh, great. I really enjoy that one. We'll put links to all those books and resources, Paul, uh, in their show notes for our listeners so uh, they can check that out. So uh, we've started doing a lightning round, and that's kind of fun. We're just going to fire off a bunch of different random things at you, and and we'll see what comes back if you're willing to play. All right. Sure. All right, man. So let's just start with easy stuff, man. Favorite food? I think I could eat Indian food every day and never get tired of it. (laughs) Never get tired of it, huh? All right. How about uh, favorite adult beverage? Oh, it's hard to beat a good gin and tonic in my mind. Okay. Gin and tonic, man. Okay. Nothing wrong with that. How about music? Oh, gosh. Um, I have pretty wide-ranging taste in music. Um, I mean, I can absolutely dig on a on a Beethoven symphony, and I can rock out to Guns N' Roses. So um, <laughs> that's what was popular when I was a teenager. Nice. Um, and that's my go-to uh, Halloween costume. Um, but... Uh, yeah, I couldn't say a favorite for music. Okay, okay. We'll, we'll, we'll let you slide on that. Um, <laughs> how about uh, destinations? Somewhere do you like to go that you haven't been yet? That I would like to go. Um, I would like to go to Africa. Okay. What about the, yeah. your favorite place that you have been? I'd probably say China was one of the more fascinating places I've ever traveled to. I got a chance to go there about 15 times um, and uh, not just for business, but really get into kind of the countryside and, and uh, just incredible country. 
That's awesome. How about, I guess I will ask you, since you're a car guy, what's your favorite car? My favorite car? Um, you know, I, I, I always come back to have just a really fun soft spot for the original McLaren F1. Nice. It was just such a remarkable car when it came out. And, uh, you know, it's not the fastest anymore. Um, but, uh, but man, that was an incredible car. There you go. All right. How about, uh, pets, dogs, cats, both other, um, not at the moment. Um, have had them over the years, had a cat. Uh, I've always been more of a cat person than a dog person, but we, we had some dogs too. Um, but, uh, yeah, the funny story and this, <laughs> I shouldn't say this out loud, but when I was five, six, seven, I had cat posters completely blanketing my walls <laughs> in my bedroom. <laughs> <laughs> I just, yeah anyway for what it is but but you grew out of it right i grew out of it no all longer right, cat right. posters just just clarify I'd be married if i had cat posters all over my walls <laughs> very good last one have the art right, since you are married you mentioned your wife a few times in this episode if you had to do a a, a a date night what are you guys doing what are we doing for a date night well in covid we're uh watching netflix but um but uh we love putting together a picnic and going down to the, the waterfront park. Uh, the, the town I live in, Bellingham, is right on the Pacific Ocean. Um, and there's, there's the islands out there. And just, yeah, sitting, sitting on, a, on a warm summer evening with a picnic with the, with the ocean right there. Is, nice. Uh, it's tough to beat that. Can't beat that, man. Well, that was a great lightning round, Paul. So thank you for playing along there. My pleasure, Chris. Absolutely. Those are fun questions. Yeah, yeah. Just lo we love to get our listeners to, to to know the person a little bit more, man. So uh, we always wrap up the Eco Ask Why, and we've had such a great time talking with you today. But we we focus on the why, you know. Mm -hmm. And it talks about your passion. So you know, if somebody were to come up to you, Paul, and say, you know, what is your personal why? What what would that be? Yeah, um, yeah. I I I do what I do because I just absolutely love helping people. I love improving processes, striving for perfection, even though you'll never reach it because there's always more there, uh, making things better. Um, I love connecting people with ideas and with other people and with things that can improve their life. It feels like it's just all one big, huge puzzle. And my mind's always working on stuff and I just can't get enough of it. And, and um, that's, that's really what drives me. That's awesome. That's awesome. I mean, helping people is so important. And, and Paul, this has been a, a pleasure again for people that want to connect with Paul that, that check the show notes out. We'll have all the, the links and resources there to be able to, uh, to, to get with him to get with pro shop. And Paul, you've been a, a great guest. Thank you so much for sharing everything you did on eco ask why. It's my pleasure, Chris. Like I said, you run a class act here. It's been a really, it's been really fun to, to talk with you. Appreciate Thank all the time and effort you put into making this a great show. Absolutely. Thank you, sir. All right. Take care. You too. Now. Thank you for listening to Eco Ask Why. This show is supported ad-free by Electrical Equipment Company. Eco is redefining the expectations of an electrical distributor by placing people and ideas before products. Please subscribe and share with your colleagues and friends. Also, leave comments, feedback, and any new topics that you would like to hear. To learn more or to share your insights, visit EcoSY.com. That's E-E-C-O-A-S-K-S-W-H-Y.com.